Hello to all of your food safety friends and welcome to today's free food safety Friday webinar. So unfortunately uh, today I cannot be uh, in this webinar live with you and answer your questions because of some of the additional things I have to do but uh, the good thing about these online webinars is that we can actually record it previously and uh, you know exclusively play it for you on this Friday and of course if you have any questions about this webinar at the end you can of course contact me send it to Simon and I will gladly answer to you so let's start with the presentation and today we are going to talk about the optimization of the expenses of the food safety uh, system and uh, I'm sure that you will enjoy this food safety Friday presentation so once again hello to all food safety friends and thank you for logging into this presentation and thank you IFSQN for giving all of us place to share and to learn about food safety special thank to you Simon for being our host for these great webinars today we are going to talk about uh, how to optimize the expenses of the food safety system uh, well actually I was thinking for a long time about what we are going to talk you know from all of this experience in my uh, auditing and um, you know some consultations that i have done and all the experience as a food safety expert we always talk about the food safety systems about the requirements of the standards etc but to be honest sometimes we forget to talk or not sometimes we always forget to talk about the expenses of the food safety system and expenses of the food safety and we almost never talk about the budgeting of the food safety in your company so today i try to put in these several slides uh, some very interesting information for you about the expenses and how to optimize them and i'm hoping that this will help you in uh, these days when we have a lots of crisis situation going on in the world and we just need to take care about our budgeting about expenses but uh, on the other hand not to influence the food safety system and the uh, 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 strictness of the food safety systems that we have implemented over the previous years so practically you all know me from previous webinars I started working for IFSQN from 2015 until now I have talked about all kind of food safety topics and my goal was always to present something that you are struggling with and how I see the solutions for that from my auditing my consultation and trainer experiences I'm certified food safety expert with more than 10 years in food safety topics through implementation training and auditing businesses food safety standards are my focus but still strongly included in the standards for quality for environmental protection health and safety business continuity and risk assessment currently i'm on a position of product manager for certification and trainings in food standards in certification body of quality austria where i'm also accredited auditor and trainer with more than 600 audits performed in different industries and more than 5,000 persons trained even more trained through the online platforms so my vision is actually to find a new ways to analyze risk in food safety and defining of methods that will be used in industries across the world my strategy is to develop and research new topics in food safety presenting them through the webinars through the trainings forums blogging and publications there is also a new thing from the beginning of the 2019 I started my own video blog called addicted to food vlog it is focused on food safety topics available on LinkedIn Instagram Facebook and YouTube uh, it is still in developing mode focused on market of Southeast Europe but there are translation included for new videos and you can also visit my website addicted to food.me so please go there contact me on LinkedIn uh, uh, add me on on uh, Instagram also and please don't hesitate to contact me, uh, with me I really enjoy your questions and I'm really happy to answer on them and to communicate with you so please um uh, go there find me and uh, yeah contact me 
So actually, what I wanted to talk with you today is expenses of the food safety system. And when you look about the expenses in the food safety system, when you look about the financial aspects, the only thing that you will find on the internet are books about the food safety economics. And when you find a book about the food safety economics, what you uh, can uh, research there is actually that food safety economics is relatively new thing. And there, there, there are a limited number of studies that have been published and they're scattered over the domain. And the uh, main thing why food safety economics is mentioned and why there are a lot of um, uh, works now on, on some specific books presenting food safety economics is because contaminated food can lead to high economic losses for agri-food industry and the society. When we look at the definition of the food safety economics, it combines the fields of food safety and economics to investigate the allocation of scarce resources and decisions made by economic actors in the food supply chain related to food safety management. Food safety economics provides insight into the economic consequences of contaminated food placed on the market, cost-effective control and monitoring of food safety hazards, the attitude of producers and consumers towards these measures and initiatives of farmers and producers to apply these measures. So research in food safety economics is relatively new and scattered. There are several books that you can find online. Of course, some of them you have to pay for, but they're talking about the food safety economics. One of them that is available you can find, and this is uh, uh, this is uh, there is also a link for this uh, short article, and in this link you can find the USD Economic Research Service. Actually, the article called the Economics of Improving Food Safety. What is written is this article is actually. Uh, that Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that between 6 million and 33 million people contract foodborne illnesses from microbial, microbial pathogens each year, and of those, as many as 9,000 die. So, this economic of improving food safety presented approach that is called cost of illness. And this cost of illness approach measures the sum of medical expenses and lost productivity due to illness or death. Basically, this approach measures the cost of unsafe food as the cost of treating foodborne diseases plus lost productivity when victims can't work. And probably you have heard about this approach. The advantage of the cost of illness approach is that it employs available data that are fairly reliable and consistent over time because the concepts are both easy to understand and data are obtainable from market transactions. Cost of illness measures have been widely used for several decades. And how we know that? Because, because of this cost of illness approach, World Health Organization measured the number actually of uh, of uh, the cost actually of unsafe food as the cost of treating foodborne diseases and uh, came to a result that because of these foodborne diseases workers are not working there is a low productivity for at least two days per month or two days per uh, per year about because of the treating of foodborne diseases and then world health organization said well we need to do something about these foodborne diseases and we need to put it under the control and that was the point when world health organization together with the codex alimentarius said Okay, we have a solution. This solution is called Codex Alimentarius together with HCCP system. And from this point, World Health Organization promoted Codex Alimentarius and HCCP. And with this, all the legislation actually implemented in the requirements, for example, as the food safety law, that HCCP is a must for all the producers or 
everyone who is involved with the food food chain and actually who is dealing with the food uh, products. So actually because of this cost of illness approach, it was measured that there are high costs connected with the treating of foodborne diseases. Because of this, World Health Organization needed some way, uh, something to introduce to lower the cost of treating foodborne diseases or to lower the potentials for uh, uh, foodborne diseases. And then this was the actual point where, where HCCP became a must. So today we have a normal HCCP as something that is normally used in every company that is dealing with uh, uh, food products, handling or producing or transporting or whatever, you know. And this is how you can connect the economics for the improving of food safety. But I want to talk about something totally different. And... Uh, this could be supported by very interesting column right by Matt Ragusci, who uh, and this is actually uh, the column written on the January this year. And the topic was the cost of food safety correction with prevention. So I want to read a part, part of it for you, which is very interesting. And Matt said... Every company that grows, produces, packs, processes, distributes, and serves food has a food safety culture. In the food industry, when looking at food safety culture, there are essentially two groups, the correction and prevent prevention group. So please keep in mind this. So the correction and the prevention groups. Basically, the prevention group is consistently improving their food safety practices to minimize foodborne illness, while the correction group waits until there is an outbreak to make changes. So, if you look at all of the previous uh, several slides that we mentioned, actually, we can connect all of this with the correction groups. And what was previously understood as the economics of the food safety was always connected with some um, corrections, you know, where we calculate what is the problem uh, that is there, or we calculate some outbreak and the expenses for this outbreak or the, or the expenses for the recall or withdrawal of the product. And then we say, okay, we don't want these expenses. We need to do something in our company not to have these additional expenses. But on the other hand, there is a preventive group. And this preventive group, it is more of an investment upfront, but in the end helps reduce risks and costs. And what Matt actually said here is that food safety prevention is an ongoing journey of understanding your many risks and implementing procedures and process to minimize these risks. Prevention is not a one-person job, but rather the whole company needs to join the common cause of protecting the brand and more uh, importantly, customer lives. But again, he's mentioning something very important. The cost, though, is always a huge consideration and can become a deterrent to implementation. Oftentimes, owners or managers of facility will say the cost of food safety prevention is so prohibitive that we can't implement the program. Yes, there is a cost to building implementing and maintaining a preventive food safety program. However, this cost pales in comparison to a corrective program. Why is that? This is, for me, very understandable. From the 10-year experience, or more than 10-year experience now, uh, of auditing different companies, different level of development of these companies, especially in the, in the developing countries, I understood from the point of view of the owners, of the workers, and from the point of view of the um, you know, auditors and, and uh, consultants, how costs connected with the food safety really works. And my complete understanding was actually uh, summed up in this magnificent column wrote by Matt. So 
Actually, what I understood from this experience is that corrective or the corrections are very, very expensive. You know, maybe they are good because we are focusing, you know, um, uh, you know, that I'm focusing not to have an outbreak or, uh, um, you know, I don't want to spend additional money because what if outbreak doesn't come and, you know, and I realized that it is, this is, this is not what now all the standards are promoting this is not the food safety uh, culture understanding of the food systems so today food safety culture is actually asking from the companies to build up a food safety prevention programs and in these food safety prevention programs this is actually something that needs um you know, investing, and this is actually something that uh, can, if you really think about them, can really work on uh, optimization of your expenses. And what I mean uh, under this, I will show you on next slide. And it is very practical. I want you to be open and think about this. So I would like to continue with only preventive food safety program expenses and where to look for optimization so i will not talk about what is the expense of the outbreak or what is the exp uh, expenses of the uh, customer complaints and then show you how these expense expenses are are high uh, and how you can then calculate what you will invest will you invest this this money of outbreak not uh, happening in your improvement or you will save this money so what what will you do you know so this is not so practical i want that we be very practical so i will cover several topics and i will try to show you where you can look for optimization from my point of view and my experiences of course this is only my experience some of the things you can find that, that are maybe not good but i'm really open to discussion with you and please if you have some you know ideas or something please send it to me or open a question on the forum of the ifs clan so let's start from the first point let's start from the facility you know building or renting plan of production facility can influence on food safety expenses increase in future due to wrong layout crossing of roads clean dirty and insufficient space for safe operations etc why i'm saying this because in so many cases i had the um, call or the meeting with uh, new you know um, uh, with the person who wants to uh, build a new production facility or who wants to rent some uh, area and, and adjust it to be a production facility. And uh, these persons need some um, inputs on how to do it, you know. And then we sit down and we look at the layout of the of the uh, facility and we write down and then we talk a little bit about, you know, um, uh, about the layout, about the areas, or about the type of um, production that that this person will have in this building. Then we talk a little bit about the crossing of roads, clean and dirty, and then we talk about insufficient space for safe uh, operations. And when we start talking about this, they realize that they will have to invest. They will have to have maybe additional areas they will have to have maybe additional you know corridors for transport or um maybe they will have to do some additional adjustments to the facility and here facility design and layout needs to be considered by specialists from intended food industry you know if i'm not a specialist in meat industry how i can understand maybe the layout for your facility and if you build it and we have an issue then later on 
you will have additional expenses maybe you will have to uh, you know um, destroy some of the walls maybe you will have you will need some uh, widening of the areas maybe your drains are not uh, uh, installed properly or whatever so if you are doing the building or renting of the uh, and you plan to open production facility please think about the all uh, aspects that could influence in future your food safety and also legality you know so in this case please consider the specialist from intended food industry you use the specialist you pay the specialist but this money that you pay for the specialist are this this is not expense you look at it as investment because later on you will not have any issues you know i have seen uh, facilities that were built like 30 years ago and they were built according to really good plans with using good really good um building materials and after 30 years they are still operating properly they don't have the crossing of uh, roads clean dirty they are very easy to refurbish if something is damaged very easy to clean and you know this is a really good start where, uh, upon which you can build everything else you know layout plan and surrounding area should follow business plan for development and increase of business you know sometimes you are thinking about okay i'm gonna build facility that will produce um let's say 500 kilograms of my product or or five tons of my product per day and during the year i'm gonna produce this and that you know but is this following really your business plan for the size of your facility maybe for the first or third year this size of the facility is okay but have you already planned the widening of the facility and the potential for for widening if you build your facility near to other facilities how you can wide your facilities can you go up maybe to build some uh, you know uh, to build some uh, floors or something like that you know so please think of on all of the aspects that are connected there with the facility with the building and think on all of the aspects that could be later connected with the food safety and here actually is the starting step where you optimize your expenses but not in uh, the uh, time of planning or building you optimize your expenses in the future maybe it would be hard to calculate it but if you uh, make mistakes you will see how expensive this is you know and of course when you think about the location you need to find the proper location that is connected good with the roads and that you can transport your products easily so think about the transporting of your products and is your facility somewhere near your customers or is it far away would you need maybe to build additional warehouse or to rent it and this is again connected with the business but for example let's take for example that you are certifying ifs in the future you know and then uh, you're certifying your production and because of the transport you need to uh, uh, to build additional warehouse and for this additional warehouse you again need to widen your scope and then you need additional money for the certification so if you think about all of these things up front you can really uh, really optimize your expenses for the future on the other hand let's talk about the equipment equipment can really be uh, a point for the good food safety um, expenses optimization so if you're buying a new equipment or uh, uh, or you are using the used equipment it is very important question for future expenses in food safety why because there is one aspect that is called hygienic design of equipment it is very important because if you have a bad design this increases use of cleaning 
resources. But under cleaning resources, I'm talking about you're using a lots of agents to clean or you need um, higher concentrations of agents. You are using additional time, which means that you're losing money. You're uh, using a lots of water maybe to rinse all of this uh, bad hygienic design. Uh, and you're using a lots of power you know for the washing so if you have a bad hygienic design of the equipment you will lose money so think about the hygienic design of your equipment how to uh, clean it easily uh, how to uh, control the cleaning easily and etc additionally for all the equipment that you are using in your facility think about the materials used for the equipment what about contact materials? In case that you didn't consider the contact materials and these materials can influence the safety of your product, you have expenses there, my friends. You know, you will have to change this equipment or you will have to change the part of the materials that are in contact with equipment and these are the additional expenses. On the other hand, if you have uh, some contact materials that are not okay and that you didn't check uh, prior to buying the equipment and these contact materials influence your product. It could be that you are damaging several batches of your product and then you need to destroy it. So this is direct expenses. And additionally, you need to change your contact materials. When we talk about the materials used for equipment, not just that hygienic design is, is important, you need to think about uh, durability of this material. Again, it is connected with the cleaning and use of this equipment, but we are also talking about the potential physical hazards. You know, if you have equipment that is used and you're buying it, you need to check this equipment for potential physical hazards. You know, when we look at the older equipment, older equipment didn't have some automatized systems, um, didn't uh, in uh, some earlier times, we didn't thought about or think about uh, potential physical hazards from in, coming from the machine and you would have on these older machines all over this uh, protective, uh, you know, plexiglass or or uh, protective uh, plastic parts, etc. And these are all potential physical hazards that could be uh, breakable during the movement of the equipment and you need to, to change it more often. And because of this, you will lose your money. This is expenses that you don't want. Maintenance of the equipment, very important because it is connected with uh, direct expenses. You know, if this is new equipment and you have some external maintenance uh, that you don't think about it, you know, it, it has its working hours, everything is digitalized, automatized, and, you know, th this is the best option at the moment. But what in case that you're using some old equipment? Then old equipment could be a potential uh, uh, food safety hazard because sometimes old equipment can use only some uh, oils or lubricants that are um, totally different and uh, in areas that are not protected. And these lubricants, sometimes they are not uh, you cannot use the lubricants that are food graded and in these cases actually this is a potential food safety hazard and if some breakage happens and this uh, lubricants comes into contact with your food then what you have done you have additional expenses you know Additionally, when we talk about the maintenance of the equipment, if you have your internal maintenance of the equipment, you need to th uh, think about additional training for your employees about the food safety program. So if they are doing the maintenance, they need to also think about the food safety of your products. Of course, this is requirement of the standards, but sometimes here you can optimize the expenses by, you know, just having uh, uh, equipment that is uh, that has easy step of maintenance and maybe uh, that only uses the lubricants that are uh, food graded or NSF uh, graded and etc. Uh, again, what I'm always saying: how you can do optimization. You cannot just uh, 
do the optimization by cutting of the expenses. You can also uh, maybe do the optimization of expenses by getting more uh, value values for the same money so if you are buying equipment and you have a support of the producer of equipment in such a way that they can help you in hazard analysis that they are doing some trend analysis for you that uh, uh, really uh, is, is, that also trains your operators etc then for the money that you are giving for the this equipment you are getting really valuable support so I will mention here, for example, some monitoring equipment and control equipment. For example, you are buying a metal detector and uh, you can cut on expenses, first of all, by metal detector selection. You need to think about um, wh which uh, products are going to pass metal detector. You know, uh, do you need metal detector that is uh, mounted on a pipeline or it is a metal detector that is uh, that is used for passing of uh, uh, packed boxes of product. Um, additionally, do you need a metal detector with the system of, um, you know, removing product if something is detected? Or uh, do you need a system that, uh, that shows the alarm? Uh, in case that you have, you know, this metal detector that only stops the production, um, production line, then this could be very, uh, very cheap for you. But if you have a metal detector that shows the alarm, that records that something was was there, that has some trend analysis, that you want some uh, visual also lights when there is some metal detection, that you want some, that there is a, a direct removal of the product in case that something is detected, that you want, I don't know, uh, some, some, um, you know, wheels on your metal detector to move it to different lines, then expenses of metal detector rise. So this is how you can cut on the expenses if you really project and plan which type of metal detector exactly fits to your needs. On the other hand, what you can get for the money Maybe when you're buying metal detector from the support of the you can get the support of the producer. Maybe you can get, uh, let's say, three year uh, verification that uh, every year uh, this producer is coming and doing some verification or the monitoring or, you know, the training of your operators on the metal detector. And then you really get for for money that you are giving some additional value and this is how you can again think about the optimization of your uh, expenses you know you don't have to train it by yourself where you are going to lose your time you have some someone externally coming there and being really uh, support again when we talk about the monitoring equipment of course uh, i know some companies that has like x-ray and then additionally metal detector and in some cases this is just why why you have done it and then they say customer asks that but uh, actually have you really talked to customer and explain what is your system what is your product and then you have additional expenses which is really not needed you know sometimes it is really not needed so what i'm asking from you is when you are buying equipment or when you are using some additional services in connection with the food safety please think about this added value for the money you are giving and think where you can use it also is pest control so here for the pest control very important in the optimization of the expenses is actually to ask yourself several questions are preventive measures implemented correctly do you have air curtains protection nets on windows proper drains do you have adequate waste removal if you implemented correctly all of these preventive measures you will not have some issues with the infestation of the pests in your company you know and in these cases you can cut on the expenses of calling your pest controller coming all the time and really checking uh, what is going on or or dealing with the infestation again think about something else have you engaged external pest controller based on risk assessment for pest control and monitoring uh, 
So who decided about the number of pest controls during the year? Was it a pest controller? And how pest controller decided about the numbers of pest controls or the monitoring that he will do uh, uh, during the year? Mainly what they come, uh, come up uh, during the, the audits is that actually pest controllers, they are doing monitoring once per month. And when I ask why once per month, because when we look at the trend analysis in previous three years, you didn't have any, any uh, pest issues and your uh, company is not high risk. So why? Who decided about the number of pest controls? Do you have any risk assessment? So please, if you do not have it, please do a risk assessment or ask your pest controller to do together with you a risk assessment and really adjust the needs for pest controlling and monitoring in your company. Maybe if you train internally some of the employees to do the monitoring, you can do pest control uh, external monitoring every second month and uh, once per month your internal employee can do a monitoring. And then you cut it a little bit about uh, on these expenses. You know, what the Ask yourself, what additionally can pest controller offer for you in the same price? Maybe he can offer training of employees once per year. Maybe he can send you some emails with the new insights in pest controlling methods. That, that's what I would expect from my pest controller for the money that I'm giving to him. Use of software tools for trend analysis. You know, today, a lot of pest controllers are using software tools where you as a customer have access and actually you don't print any of the documents. You don't use any uh, written reports in, in paper. You have this access to the software tool and you access as a customer to the software tool. This is included in their own, in their monitoring regular. And here you can click and find trend analysis for your company. You can find a lot of valuable data. All the following documents are there in this software. So actually, yeah, this is very good plus. And you don't have additional expenses on printing or or time used for archiving on, of all documents and checking are they all in uh, valid, etc. Additionally, think what your company and pest controller company can do together to improve pest control in facility. So I have some of the clients, for example, where pest controller is coming um, during the audit, external audit, and pest controller representative actually is coming to their company and really defending the pest controlling part during the audit. So why not? If this is a good thing that pest controller can offer for you, why not use it? You know, so look about these things. This is additional value for the money that you are giving for the pest controller. And if you can think about something else, please do write to me. Let's let's uh, think about it together. Then we come to the laboratory again. Very interesting thing. Let's talk about the external laboratory uh, sampling plan. Is it done by uh, uh, or, uh, by you, this risk assessment, or by external laboratory? So uh, who developed, actually, laboratory sampling plan? Have you developed it or together with the laboratory? Or laboratory came and told you, aha, uh -huh, this is your product, this is the legislation, this is your sampling plan, and you just adjust to it and you pay for it. So can you maybe optimize external laboratory sampling according to your risk assessment? Please do review your risk assessment and see how many samplings you are doing during the year and uh, laboratory testing what, and what are you getting from the laboratory, how you can use these results, etc. Maybe you can cut on expenses there. So again, think about how can you optimize external laboratory sampling number because your previous three year sampling showed no non conformities. For example, if you are testing water every month for microbiology and your water is coming for, from the municipality uh, um, supplier, municipal supplier, and this is uh, publicly used water also, and 
in last three years, you didn't have any microbiological issues with your laboratory uh, uh, testing, you know, for the water. Why do you test it again every once? You know, maybe you can cut it and you can uh, test it to, uh, once in two months or quarterly, you know, and then you really cut on the expenses. Again, think about optimization, external laboratory sampling due to implementation of internal fast sampling methods. So if you are using once per month that company external laboratory is coming and checking the swabs for uh, work surfaces, hands, etc., and then they are taking let's say 10 swabs per month and then you are paying for this uh, report, etc. This is good. Of course, it's okay. But what if you implement some internal fast sampling methods? You know, these fast sampling methods are are working on a different, different. Uh, it's a different method. It's not microbiology. It is checking of the, I don't know, it is the ATP swabs where you check the uh, relative luminosense units. But okay, with this again, you are checking the cleanliness, for example, and you are doing some kind of monitoring. And maybe because of that, you don't have to engage external laboratory once per month. Maybe you can do it quarterly again. Okay? And then additionally, check the legislation uh, about laboratory testing and what is your customer asking again. Sometimes you can optimize your expenses by just doing what, what customer is asking. For example, if you are doing the testing of the products according to your product groups in a year and you have one customer that is saying you need to perform at least uh, one laboratory uh, report and deliver it uh, for the private label products that you are doing for me. Maybe you can do only what is this ca customer asking and then you already checked several groups of products so you don't have to check it again. So you satisfied what is customer asking and what is your own internal rules. So maybe you can cut on laboratory expenses there. And again, think about who is performing inline process control internal laboratory staff or line operators if we are talking about internal laboratory staff maybe you can put down a little bit this pressure on internal laboratory staff you know so they can do some additional things and then you save on time and of course you optimize the expenses if you train line operators who are already working with the equipment to also do some process controls um, during the production. If you train them, you invest some time in the training, maybe you can cut on expenses over there. So think about that. Think about that. Maybe sometimes if you uh, train some additional people, you can, on the other hand, uh, you know, uh, lower the activities for other people and use then these other people for, you know, managing uh, something else. And then you really optimize on the expenses here. You know, you you have additional time maybe uh, to use by uh, additional time uh, to be used by these employees. Okay, audits, very interesting. So uh, think about several questions here. What your certification body can offer additionally for your company? So is if your certification body is coming only once per year and this certification body is actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually just uh, doing audit once per year and this they, they, they do it in one day or three days and then deliver to your report with uh, non-conformities or only recommendations is this only the, the you know that you give money is this total value that you are getting maybe you can get some additional trainings or some short focus audits to improve your systems or some gap analysis from the certification body why you don't ask them that you know maybe they can do it for you for very uh, you know small amounts of money but you increase the uh, strictness of your food safety system and then you optimize it some on some additional expenses you know i have uh also met because i'm doing a lots of supplier audits i have met also some uh, um 
companies which have several certification bodies for several standards. And in this case, they, uh, to be honest, have a lots of expenses. If you are that company, please calculate it. You know, if several certification bodies are doing the several standards, are cer certifying several standards in your company, that's a lots of expenses. You can sometimes call one certification body to do all the standards. And in these cases, they can for sure optimize the hours for the complete, uh, uh, for the several standards, and then you will get a lower price. Again, what I'm seeing is that company having separated audits for several standards during the year. This is a lot of pressure on your employees. Why you are doing that? Think, think about your employees and time they invest to prepare for these audits several times per year. If you have it one time per year, all audits in one week or two weeks, of course, they will lose time to prepare you know, of course, they have to be ready during the whole year, but additional preparement for the audits can be done only in this period. You know, and then you can optimize your work, your your use of additional time, etc. And that's how you optimize on the expenses again. Of course, if if all the standards, that, if all the audits are done in one time or in one week, several standards, they uh, the certification body can lower the total time of audits. If they are done as a separate audits, they cannot lower the time. They have to do it as a separate complete hours, and then you have to pay it more. Again, supplier evaluation and audits, have you considered the certification of the suppliers? So maybe if they are certified according to specific GFSI certification scheme, you don't have to go there for an audit. I have seen so many retailers, they are asking from their own suppliers to be certified according to GFSI, IFS, FSSC, SQF, etc. And when they are certified and they have a defined level of, uh, of uh, certification, proved on the certificate retailer saying okay you are good we don't have to visit you for three years if uh, you maintain your certification and then you don't go to audits so you don't lose resources you don't lose time on this or maybe you can perform audits on every three years depending on the results nobody's saying how often you should do it maybe you can do the audits of your suppliers once in a three years if they are really good and that's again how you optimize the expenses. Of course, what about the training of your internal audit team? Maybe you can train your internal audit team by sending two of the employees to external training and you pay for it. And then these external, these uh, employees are coming back to the company and perform the internal training for additional 10 of your employees. Then you actually paid, I don't know, $200 for the training, but didn't train just two of employees. You trained 12 employees for $200. Think about the tools for auditing. Some of the tools are uh, available as softwares on the internet that are free. Maybe you can use them to optimize your auditing time and to lower the expenses used for this. You know. Again, where to look for the optimization? We are always talking about the automatization, about digital but what about the digitalization of the uh, systems? So here I'm talking about the use of food safety management system tools, some of them for the optimization in managing of documented information. And here you can look up, you look up for the more from food software tool. This is very useful tool, very easy to implement and could help you in lower any, um, you know, problematics connected with the employees in the production and and the risk connected with the employees uh, uh, bad controls or you know um, not communicating about potential hazards etc again some of the free available tools why you don't use them you can download for free food defense tool like food defense plan builder and build your food defense system why you don't use it again food fraud tool from csafe 
uh, uh, website. Why you don't use it? Please download it and use it as your food fraud tool. Again, CSAF has offered food safety culture evaluation tool. You can download it and also use it for free. Training tools as IFSQN, you're already using some food safety Fridays. This is free. So this is optimization of your food safety expenses, you know. And from here, you can go to other trainings of IFSQN offered for very low money because they are they are done online. You're, you know, for, for $97, you can find lots of interesting and very valuable trainings. They last for four hours, but you have at the end some certificate that you really passed a good training with the trainers that cannot come to your location because they are far away, but they are specialists in their job. So please use it. This is how you optimize your expenses of the food safety system. What about the cleaning? I didn't want to mention cleaning at the beginning. I wanted to mention it later, you know, because I don't want you that you start in the beginning from the optimization of cleaning. I don't want you that you optimize the cleaning and then influence your um, uh, uh, you know, company in such way that you do some cross contamination and insufficient cleaning, and then you have uh, uh, some problem. But what I want you to do is to answer on a several questions. Have you measured the effectiveness of your cleaning procedures? And how have you measured the effectiveness of your cleaning procedures? You know, maybe your pro pro cleaning procedures are uh, uh, more than enough. Maybe you can cut here on some expenses, but you need to analyze it and think how. What is the minimum dosage of cleaning agent to be used to have effective cleaning? Have you communicated that with your supplier of the cleaning agents? Maybe um, you don't have to use the same dosage of cleaning agent in the same um uh, in the different uh, type of production. So you, you don't use the same dosage of cleaning in the production of um, marmalade and the same dosage of cleaning agents uh, in the production of fresh meat. You know, although it is the same cleaning agent, you don't have to use the minimum dosage is different. And maybe, you know, supplier of the cleaning agent is always saying you need to use this dosage because, you know, you need to you need to use this cleaning agent. But what is the minimum cleaning schedule and cleaning dosage to have effective cleaning? Think about it. You know, maybe you don't have to clean uh, between each shift, but at the end of the whole working day, in that case, you are really uh, lowering the expenses for your cleaning agents. Think about how cleaning agents are used. Sometimes, you know, they can be ready for use, which is good because you get already prepared cleaning agent and your only uh, thing that your employee has to do is to use it. He needs to be trained. But if you have to prepare, you know, and to prepare some, some dosage and some concentration, etc., then you have to train your employees and then they can um, have some mistakes in the concentration uh, and the dosage and then you would have some insufficient cleaning and then you have some additional expenses, you know, because of bad microbiology or, or product spoilage, etc. So in this, all of these cases, think about the additional value for the money you're giving. Do you have a support of the cleaning agent supplier? Maybe they can do the training once per year for your employees or the monitoring of cleaning for you or maybe give you some trend analysis. You no, know, uh, because you are buying the cleaning agents from them. You expect from them to be your support in the cleaning process. And this is how you optimize in the cleaning, not just lowering the amount of the cleaning, but really trying to understand the process and to get to the best from the process in your supplier. Personal hygiene, where you can optimize there. How often do employees have to change work uniforms during the year? You know, do, do they have three, two, three, five sets of uniforms, 30 sets of uniforms? What about the shoes? How often do you have to change the shoes? What is the quality of shoes? Maybe you are always changing the shoes because cleaning agents are destroying your shoes. And then 
you know you you are having the expenses every month because of this but if you buy more quality shoes or you use some protections of the shoes while you are doing the cleaning you can save here you know so think about the washing is it done by employees internally in the company or by externally engaged services and here how you can think about expenses again i have heard several days ago on one audit the wardrobe utilization so how many uh, cabinets do you have for uh, employees wardrobes do you have one cabinet for one employee and then you have uh, three shifts and then you have 300 employees in three shifts and then you have a uh, 300 cabinets or maybe you can have 100 cabinets for uh, 300 employees why because one cabinet can be used by three of them in different shifts only at the end of each shift employee has to remove everything from the uh, cabinet and clean it so that other ones can use it so this is a wardrobe utilization and you spend a lot of money to have a cabinet for every employee etc why you don't have to do that again think about the expenses uh, for the gloves that you are using, sometimes you are using protective, protective hygienic gloves, but the use of gloves is not based on the risk assessment. And you said, we will use the gloves everywhere. And then you have that employees are using gloves, you know, they are changing it, uh, uh, but actually you don't need gloves. Maybe you are in su such type of production where you don't need gloves. So please think about doing the risk assessment and really understand, do you need this? Again, think about the washing facilities for the hand washing. Maybe you need hand to change the hand washing facilities, you know, to have the hand washing facilities with the uh, sensors on them so that uh, there is not uh, a lot of water spent for the hand washing. Or again, think about the uh, drying of the hands. Are you using air dryers or you are using the paper towels and which uh, quality of the paper towels? You know, sometimes uh, you can really lower the expenses on this. If you just put a little note that three paper towels are sufficient to wipe your hands, you know, just this little information and you save on it. So there are potentials for you to optimize the expenses in your food safety programs. So please start right now with some small initiatives and small objectives that you can you can do. So where else can you optimize? Please think about it. Sit down, start from these small things that I have talked about, you know, start from them and then you try to optimize. For me, best is to start from the prerequisite programs you know start there see what is the risk assessment needed for the implementation of your prps and then check where you can really optimize there you know um, and with this optimization you are going actually to to lower the expenses for the food safety program why i'm saying this because um more than 10 years, I have been listening to quality managers, to food safety managers, that they are saying always, you know, top management doesn't want to listen about the number of nonconformities, about the, you know, uh, laboratory sampling and this and that, because they are talking only uh, in a money sense. So why? I'm asking all the quality managers, food safety managers, why you are not talking through the money so why you are not showing everything through the money so have first thing uh, to have is a food safety budgeting really develop it develop the food safety budgeting what is a budget for your food safety and then from here you see first of all you think about the budget what is everything included in the food safety budget and from here you really develop where you can you can optimize this budget during the year you know and this is how you can talk to your top management you know 
they would understand if you if they say that they understand only money and you say they only understand money yeah then you talk money and that's a good start so start from the prps uh, learn more on my next training that uh, i'm going to talk about this next training will be paid one go in the ifs coin on the paid paid trainings go there really and uh you know you you find there a link for the next training there is a next training that we are going to talk about the uh, practical supplier evaluation and the uh, audit of suppliers and there we are also talking about some uh, some expenses and how you can optimize them and we are talking about the whole process of the evaluation of the supplier which would really help you in uh, understand your purchasing uh, uh, process and your uh, supplier um, uh, correlation you know so learn more my next training go also on forums and uh, of course if you have uh any additional ideas or questions i'm really open to talk about this topic so please feel free to contact me and uh yeah i hope that you will save money in this year because yeah that the the year is is started tough you know after this covid and there are some really crazy situation over there so uh, we at IFS Coin really try to develop for you some trainings that you can practically use. So uh, I give you best of luck to to uh, optimize your uh, food safety expenses. So thank you guys once again for listening. I'm sorry again for not being there in live to get your questions and to talk with you, but. Uh, I hope that you uh, enjoyed the other hand and uh, you know that I'm always available. So, yeah, see you on our next presentation. And uh, I leave you with uh, Simon, uh, very capable hands, and probably he can talk further with you. So bye-bye, have a nice weekend, and uh, enjoy.